asleep. Um, maybe he's dead. Good day and greetings to you wherever you are connected from in the world. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the third day of this inaugural Travel Retail Sustainability Week event and the third session of the day. Back to the drawing board, how sustainability is forging powerful new partnerships. I'm Michael Barrett, Head of Events and Corporate Social Responsibility at TR Business and I'm looking forward once again to hosting another TR Sustainability Week webinar alongside my colleague, Luke Barris-Hill, Acting Managing Editor at TR Business. I want to start by thanking all the session sponsors, Arianta International, Beam Suntory, Brown Foreman, Coty, and Mondelez International. This afternoon's session promises an in-depth look at how partnership models are emerging from the whole sustainability agenda, 
with an excellent lineup of speakers who Luke will introduce in just a few moments. As for the session so far, if you've missed any or want to watch them again, you can, of course, view all these sessions on demand by just clicking on the session name each day here on the event platform. After Monday's inspiring keynote session with David Katz, we had a great session on sustainable beauty, with a dynamic panel of beauty specialists on Monday afternoon. We had a highly engaging session with industry leaders from retailers and brands yesterday morning, followed by a session yesterday afternoon dedicated specifically to alternatives to single use plastics, which was certainly enlightening. This morning's session featuring a social enterprise and two NGO perspectives on how they are approaching the plastic pollution problem left much food for thought. And of course, moving my slides forward, we've now seen three of the four sustainability pitch sessions, revealing the companies that have achieved travel retail sustainability trailblazer and hero status. Congratulations to L'Occitane en Provence and L'Oreal for achieving the four-star travel retail sustainability trailblazer status and to Lego for achieving the travel retail sustainability hero status. As we announced during this morning's session about the sustainability pitch, we have received a huge amount of positive feedback on this program, not least of all from the fantastic lineup of judges, all senior executives with airports and retailers, including one of our speakers here today, um, but also ETRC, Mindset, and this week's keynote speaker, David Katz. Now the flame has been lit, we aim to keep the torch burning and continue celebrating sustainable initiatives. The Sustainability Pitch Program will remain open to any company wishing to submit a proposal to our resident panel of judges. A number of judges have already expressed an interest in continuing to work with us on this journey, so we're delighted to launch this ongoing initiative already with such strong endorsement. We'll be announcing more details on how the sustainability pitch will operate on tlbusiness.com very soon, so stay tuned. And more breaking news from this morning. One of our keynote speakers who was unable to make it on Monday will be taking part in the closing keynote session, which is scheduled for Friday, the 23rd of April at 11.30 a.m. UK time. Anton Bailey, head of consumer and retail Asia Pacific and head of technology, media and telecoms Hong Kong at KPMG, We'll be sharing the latest KPN, KPMG insights on sustainability from both a consumer and investor perspective in a session entitled Living in a More Sustainable World. So do, do tune into that one, please. And finally, in more breaking news, as part of the celebrations around World Earth Day, each year on the 22nd of April, the event around which the Travel Retail Sustainability Week has been organized, TR Business will be streaming the live feed from the Earth Day live event directly here on the Travel Re Retail Sustainability Week platform. TR Business has partnered with EarthDay.org, the event organizers, to bring this event to the global travel retail sector via our own sustainability event. The live feed will commence immediately after the close of our final session tomorrow on Thursday, the 22nd of April in the afternoon UK time. Once again, we place great importance on thanking all the companies who are supporting this inaugural event on sustainability in travel retail. It's thanks to these amazing partners and their investment that has made it possible for us to bring all these webinars and networking opportunities to you completely free of charge. TR Business owners Nigel Hardy and Janice Hook made the decision to make access free of charge to all of you so we can facilitate the knowledge sharing on these vital topics and ensure you meet with the companies investing in sustainable solutions and continue the conversation on sustainability with both current and potential partners. This is TR Business's commitment to driving the industry sustainability agenda. So our thanks to all of these companies. Altia, Arianta International, Beam Suntory, Brown Foreman, Coty, Dufry, Frass, Guerlain, Join the Pipe, Chris Shop, Lego, L'Occitane en Provence, L'Oreal Travel Retail, Molten Brown, Mondelez International, Moroccan Oil, Nestle, Pure Essential, Ritter Sport, and Silent Pool Gin. Thanks to all of you. Before I hand over to Luke, just a few housekeeping notes. I'm sure you're quite familiar with the event platform by now, but please do visit our event partners, sustainability networking hubs, where you can discover the various sustainable investments from a number of airports, retailers, brands, social enterprises, and NGOs. You can message them or schedule appointments with them, see their videos and download their sustainability reports and news. 
You can also schedule appointments with each other through the attendees tab in the top right uh, of the top menu or via the schedule appointment button on the My Event page. And if you have any questions about any aspect of the event, please do get in touch with us via our own help desk hub where our colleague Helen Chater will answer any queries. Just click on that join virtual meeting button anytime between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. UK time. And you can video or audio chat with her there or leave us a message and we'll get back to you. And just uh, had a question earlier on, the hubs and the networking platform will remain open for up to three months after this event. So do come back uh, and visit those hubs at any time over the next three months. We've had lots of questions during all the sessions so far, so do please use this opportunity to question our speakers about their sustainability achievements and plans. They're here to answer your questions too. And the Q&A button is on the right hand side of your screen. So without any further ado, I'll now hand over to Luke, who will introduce this session and the panellists. Over to you, Luke. Thank you very much, Michael. Greetings on day three of Travel Retail Sustainability Week. To all of you rejoining our programme, and obviously if you're joining the programme for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. I'm Luke Barris hill Acting Managing Editor at TR Business, as Michael mentioned. And like Michael, I'd like to take this opportunity to extend my thanks to our session partners, Ariant International, Brown Foreman, Coty and Mondelez, and indeed to all our premium partners for making this event happen. It's worth reminding, as Michael mentioned, that Access to Travel Retail Sustainability Week and the engagement and networking is offered on a complimentary basis. And without the support of our partners, this type of event simply would not be possible. I'd also like to take this chance to congratulate our Travel Retail Sustainability Pitch Trailblazers and Heroes, Lego, L'Occitane en Provence, L'Oreal, uh, for those accolades today. Now, as Michael announced earlier, TR Business is committed to continuing the sustainability pitch series off the back of what has been a tidal wave of interest from companies. Um, and we'll be sharing in, uh, further information on how you can get involved with our rolling program and the chance to put your sustainability plans and initiatives to our resident judging panel who will be scrutinizing uh, those pictures. And as Michael mentioned, we've heard already today some unique perspectives from NGOs and social enterprises on critical topics such as marine uh, conservation, coastline management, and tackling the blight of litter and waste. Indeed, this was a great transition after the focused wrap it up session yesterday, where we retreated to some eye-opening research, frankly, confronting the impact of single-use plastics, the consideration of some novel alternatives to single-use plastics. And loud and clear, we heard those top line messages around the importance of reducing, reusing, recycling, and substitutions to plastic wastage. So as we move into now the midway point of our, our educational webinar program are very much in the spirit of fostering greater cooperation between all stakeholders uh, in our industry and the wider global travel and tourism ecosystem. What better way to segue into a subject so pertinent to the collective recovery of our industry, partnerships and collaboration. Back to the drawing board, how sustainability is forging new and powerful partnerships is an app title for this session in which we'll hear from brands, retailers, an airport, a creative design agency, and a retail marketing consumer engagement expert. We'll be unboxing what partnership represents to those companies and how businesses have moved to strengthen engagement with their partners. For those unfamiliar with the format of our session so far, we're obviously keen to encourage as much interactivity and engagement as possible. So please do take advantage of the opportunity to put your questions to our esteemed panelists, share your observations, comments in the Q&A function uh, to the right hand side of your window pane and keep that conversation going. So without further ado, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to begin to introduce themselves uh, and their companies before we move into the session in earnest. Richard from Mondelez, can I ask you to begin? Yeah, of course. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Richard Housego. I'm part of the team at, at Mondelez World Travel Retail. I'm responsible for our in-store activation and also our sustainability agenda. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Richard. Abby, can I ask you to introduce yourself? 
Thank you, Luke. I'm Abby Lodell, work for Circle Square. We're a retail design, design agency. Um, we've been working in travel retail for many, many years. So really good to have this conversation and uh, talk about sustainability as part of the panel here. So thank you. Thank you, Abby. Shay, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, again, my name is uh, Shay folk -Bleikra. I'm a senior environmental specialist with the uh, Vancouver International Airport, or what we regionally like to call YVR. Uh, we're probably referring to that uh, those words YVR quite regularly. Um, we are Canada's second busiest airport, and uh, we're located on the west coast of Canada. And I'm here today to share with you YVR's sustainability initiatives and our work with engaging our airport community on these initiatives. Thank you. Melanie, over to you. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, so I'm Melanie Gildou. Uh, so I'm Executive Vice President of uh, Food Service and uh, CSR for La Gardère Travel Retail. Uh, so uh, specialized in travel retail, as, uh, <laughs> as you may guess. And so I would maybe uh, present you a little bit more in detail what we are doing and more than happy to be part of uh, this uh, roundtable today. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Tracy. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So Tracy Ross here from Arianta Middle East. I'm project and design manager um, in charge of design and delivery of our global travel retail stores over the past 16 plus years. Um, I'm also the sustainability champion for Arianta Middle East, and it's a subject that I am extremely passionate about. So delighted to be invited to be talking on the session today. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. It's great to have you with us. Hugo. Hi, everyone. I'm Hugo. I'm the head of Alta Bear Travel Retail. You might know me under ODG, but I'll introduce you later on what is Alta Bear Travel Retail. So we are a consultancy, design, and project management firm specialized in travel retail. And we work with brands, retailers, airport operators all around the world, providing design consultancy and more and more sustainable solutions now. Thanks, Hugo. And last but by no means least, Caroline. Caroline, would you like to, sorry, unmute yourself? Sorry, can you hear me now? Perfect. Excellent, sorry for that. So good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caroline Andrew Otti, and I'm heading today Cortis Travel Retail Division. Uh, Coty is one of the world's uh, leading beauty companies and a global leader in, uh, in fragrances. And I would like to take the opportunity really and thank uh, our TRB for the organization of this forum and giving us really the opportunity to discuss actions and programs that are taken by the industry to drive sustainability across all categories and listen from all these partners, you know, on, uh, on what the best practices are and, and what are further partnerships we can reach, and reach, reach together. Thanks, Caroline. So to kick things off, I'd like to ask a big picture question and direct that to Shay at uh, Vancouver Airport. Shay, what does partnership quite simply mean to you from a landlord perspective at Vancouver? And um, how do you consider that when you're looking to improve the circularity of your travel retail environments? Shay, can you unmute yourself? Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I said I wouldn't forget to do that, but I did. Um, so I think one of the most important components of uh, working with our airport community is, you know, ensuring that we have a, uh, a collaborative process and uh, making sure that everybody's on board and understanding what we're, we're trying to achieve. Uh, you know, rather than, uh, you know, enforcing uh, particular initiatives. And then offer also offering some range of opportunities so that we can uh, all achieve our sustainability initiatives together. And then uh, learning from one another, I think, is another critical piece. We certainly, uh, as we move as we move forward with our sustainability uh, work, uh, we certainly are uh, learning things along the way from our uh, from our uh, airport community members. So, I think those are some really critical components to uh, the program and what we look, what we look to achieve with it. We can delve into some of those in more detail shortly, Shay. Thank you very much. I'd also like to put that question to uh, Tracy at Arianta Middle East and then on to Melanie after that. 
What does partnership, Tracy, mean uh, to ARI in the way it shapes and defines how it works uh, with Abu Dhabi Airport on sustainability initiatives? And crucially, how does it differ from your work with other airports? Right, interesting question, Luke. So in the past, uh, many other airports have aspired to be LEED certified and encouraged us as the concessionaire to partake and ensure that at least our flooring and our lighting was sustainable. Um, however, this was encouraged rather than enforced, um, or perhaps as, as Shay said, um, there was a collaborative approach. Now with Abu Dhabi in comparison, the midfield terminal, which is aiming for an SD Dharma three pearl rating, sorry, SD Dharma, by the way, meaning sustainability in Arabic, um, which was inspired by the Lake Sheikh Zayed's vision, um, is a non-negotiable requirement. So there was encouraged and there's sort of enforced. Um, so what does that mean? It means that every material that was used in the construction of not only the terminal, but also our retail space, as well as each and every single piece of furniture had to be SD Dharma, SD Dharma compliant, certified by a local consultant at not only the design stage, but also at the delivery stage. Um, and together with these certificates, the delivery stage is proof of um, invoices as proof of purchase, bill of lading, certificate of origin. So it's quite a more, a more complicated approach. Um, in reference to partnerships, I think the delivering of this vision wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't filtered down from a government level, from government level down to the airport authority, ADAC in this instance, um, and then enforced by the local retail delivery team to ensure that we honored our promise that was made at bid stage right through to the design and implementation stage. So I would say, um, I could certainly say that Abu Dhabi um, or ADAC have raised the sustainability bar um, and certainly set a new standard for, for, for future airport projects and concessionaires. Um, so a very onerous, um, quite an onerous process initially, which we probably initially ob not objected to, but uh, because we didn't understand the process. Um, but once we all bought into it, and two years later, I must say that we realized the value in the process and these policies, many of which we as Arianta will be taking on board as our own um, internal policies that will form part of our sustainable design and implementation strategy. So uh, kudos to ADAC and uh, raising the bar on the sustainability requirements with the concessionaires. Tracy, it's interesting you mentioned a uh, reference there to uh, you know, the, the tender process and, and also, you know, what operators are, are looking through in terms of the, the, the bringing to fruition those sustainability um, credentials through the life cycle um, of, of the bidding stage. And we want to discuss that later because that's something that we certainly received quite a lot of uh, response to in our recent sustainability survey. There was quite some, some interesting comments around that. I just wonder, Tracy, regarding the, the challenges, I guess, of, of implementing some of those requirements uh, beyond the design build phase into operations. Um, obviously, <laughs> operations, uh, it, 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 we were waiting. Um, but what are, I guess, the, um, the challenges that you feel you're, you could face operationally um, in terms of ensuring that there's a sustainable footprint? Um, so operationally, we're working at the moment very closely with the ADAX um, marketing and sustainability team. And I think one of the first initiatives is ensuring that when we open, we open with no or minimal single use plastic. So um, ensuring that we're working towards researching alternative plant based bioplastics um, or paper um, FSC certified recycled paper packaging but um, also looking as to how we extend the sustainability message and story from the airport to a downtown, um, to the downtown market. In terms of the challenges, and I have been very um, pleased to see over the last few days, um, the movement that many suppliers have already taken, ensuring that the product which is about to be put on those very sustainable shelves 
are themselves sustainable product. And I think that's where the challenge is going to be. So we've now gone through the design process and the implementation process and adhere to the very stringent um, the policies and the procedures. But now, does that product that sits on that sustainable shelf, does it meet the same standards? And I believe the suppliers are moving in the right direction. They have all, most of them have set initiatives and goals. Um, and we may not meet all of those immediately, but that we are certainly moving in the right direction. So I would say at the moment, the product is challenging. Um, and then the debate between the um, biodegradable plastics, which is still accepted in the Middle East versus the more plant-based bio bioplastics. That's also a, a challenge at the moment. Is that regarding the packaging you're talking about, Tracy? Because yeah, so that's, all... that's regarding the package packaging. So in the Middle East, there's still um, an acceptability of biodegradable or degradable plastics, which at the end of the day are still petroleum-based plastics. We are moving towards plant-based bioplastics. Um, and it's interesting to see the movement over the last two years. When we started investigating these companies two years ago, um, they weren't on the local market. So, for example, there was a company based in Bali that we were talking to. There was another company that was purchasing from the International Plastic Bank, but manufacturing in China. So there was the carbon footprint issue. Two years down the line, I'm pleased to say that local companies have now set up um, and are able to offer these services. So there's been a movement already in two years. Thanks very much, uh, Tracy. I'd like to perhaps bring in uh, Lagadir at this point um, and uh, ask that question um, to uh, Melanie. Melanie, can you give some uh, background on how you partner with your airports when it comes to uh, sustainable initiatives? Give us a flavour of some of the initiatives uh, across, across both uh, retail and F&B uh, divisions of the company. Yes, for sure. Uh, so, well, first, coming back to uh, the notion of uh, partnership, I think that here we can mention that, uh, yes, it's at the end, it's joint efforts. Uh, so, uh, and what it means is that uh, we, we all know that it's not easy. <laughs> so, because it's an effort. So, it's uh, it's also something uh, something uh, new. I think we're, uh, and I think also your late, latest sessions uh, showed that uh, we're showing that, uh, yes, we are all a little bit uh, discovering and trying to find the solutions uh, to make things happen and so we have to be very uh, yes uh, humble about that uh, so we all learn and we believe that uh, yes the, the, the good thing uh, about uh, partnerships is really uh, to help all of us to uh, to accelerate we need to accelerate because there is a there is a big uh, well a big uh, deal around uh, all these uh, topics and uh, we need uh, we need to, to move uh, as fast as we as we can and uh, we believe also that we, we will be we will only be able to do that working together and uh, being uh, being uh, smarter and uh, moving faster so it's really the, the important thing uh, coming back to uh, to some examples with uh, some airports where we can mention of course uh, yes uh, uh, what uh, Tracy was mentioning uh, of course was uh, resonating because uh, we uh, we have also built some uh, some units in uh, in midfield uh, so I want to come back to that but uh, maybe also coming back to to uh, disposables and uh, single use plastic uh, here um, we uh, we have uh, our first uh, our first first tests, I would say, uh, were in Dubai airport uh, two years ago. So it was uh, here again, a partnership. Uh, we were also, uh, as uh, Tracy was mentioning, a little bit also, uh, uh, well, forced to, to do it uh, maybe faster than what, <laughs> that, uh, what we had in mind uh, initially, but uh, uh, we had to do it. And uh, so it was uh, all the operators uh, having to, uh, to, to, uh, to switch to no plastic. Uh, 
uh, and here I also want to mention uh, the partnership in, uh, and the, the, the common work we have done also with, together with uh, Hugo and that uh, on Dubai Airport to find solutions, be it for the plastic used in back office and in, uh, in front office. And so uh, Dubai was really our, our laboratory to be able to, uh, to erase uh, the use of uh, single use uh, plastic uh, so in our operations. And so it, it began in, uh, in it began in uh, in Dubai, and now it's live in uh, all our food service uh, operations uh, for our own brands, because uh, for our partner brands we are still uh, dependent on uh, what they are doing. But for all our own brands, and it represents more than fifty percent of uh, our turnover in food. Uh, so we have been able to switch. Uh, to uh, to uh, well to erase uh, single use plastic, uh, and so it was it came it came also from uh, from Dubai. It was also of course a decision of uh, the company and part of our CSR program. Uh, but he, yes, interesting to see uh, how uh, yes uh, something uh, something more local at uh, the, at the beginning. Well, in one airport now is uh, uh, live alive in uh, all our airports uh, in the uh, all our operations uh, around the world so uh, melanie that that um uh request or more of a kind of a legislative um driver to to get you to change uh, your plastics your single use plastics to sustainable alternatives encourage you to do that across the world how did that um impact the overall cost of going green for you at legado Yes, you're right. Of course, there is the regulation, but uh, again, yes, uh, we have been, we have, uh, we have uh, gone further uh, because uh, yes, it's uh, it's um, it's almost mandatory now in uh, in in Europe, but not yet in all the countries. But yes, we decided to uh, to 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 raise the bar and to uh, to have this decision implemented uh, implemented globally. Uh, about the cost, I think that uh, here, uh, of course, it's uh, it's always a big uh, a big topic also because we have more and more constraints on all the topics, and so uh, our our costs uh, are are always uh, or could always uh, increase, and so it could also uh, uh, make this uh, this CSR topics appear as uh, you know uh, real uh, threats uh, for uh, our business model and profitability but here we decided and we uh, we decided all together to try to to think differently about the way we were behaving all together we are a very uh, decentralized company we want to empower uh, all our countries but here yes we we had this uh, this topic and so we decided to uh, once again to, uh, to to work in a completely different manner and we decided to try not to have an extra cost uh, while doing that so uh, of course it uh, we uh, we uh, gathered and massified our purchasing uh, we decided to reduce uh, con considerably the number of SKUs we are using all around the world in terms of uh, in terms of um, disposables so of course uh, if we were counting uh, the different uh, cups and um, sizes of cups we were buying around the, the globe you know we maybe we came to uh, almost 25 sizes of cups and so uh, we decided that we having only five uh, we could uh, we could make it and so we're uh, working all together the countries all the countries the purchasing teams uh, the service business line and so on at the end, uh, no extra cost, and so we did that. Uh, yes, without any uh, without any uh, added cost. So it's also something important. So we can do also we can achieve this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, objectives uh, without uh, without any negative impact on uh, our ratios. That's impressive. And will will this will it be a similar experience when shifting from the single use plastic bags, the duty free shopping bags, which I imagine you've also obviously had to change in, in uh, certain Middle East countries to uh, as, as a very enter uh, to a more sustainable alternative? Um, is that going to represent uh, increased costs or will you be able to? And I want to throw that also to Tracy. Will you be able to do that at, at zero increased costs? To both of you. I see. Do you want to take this one? All right. Um, without a doubt, uh, Michael, they are 
they are more expensive um, in comparison to the traditional bags. So we are currently looking at, you know, comparison prices between these plant-based bio bags, your recycled paper bags, but then also looking at a reusable bag um, that can be revenue generating, um, making them bespoke to suit the operation. And they will be more expensive initially, without a doubt, but it is the right thing to do. Um, and if we can make them revenue generating, I think that there would be more buy-in from the operations. Um, so I mentioned earlier on, you know, we've recently found local companies who are making these bio bags locally, also the recycled bags, um, and recently found a company that's encouraging local collection, converting them into PET flakes locally, having them spun into yarn and fabric in India and Pakistan, returning it to the UAE and producing reusable bag, well, not only bags, but um, t-shirts, caps, masks, and uh, revenue generating merchandise. And I think, yes, there is the cost element, but there is also the story to be told and the educational side of this message, because we're not going to deliver our vision unless we educate and engage with our customers. And so I think it could be a lovely story. There's a lovely story to be told there. If we could say, right, your three bottles that you just returned now became this lovely bag or the t-shirt that I'm wearing. So um, it's, it's still a way to go and, and there is cost, but we hope that if more of us buy into, buy into these reusable um, or recycled programs, that it will ultimately reduce the costs um, as more of us buy into it. And I yeah. think we'll head that way in hopefully, let's say a year or two's time. Absolutely. And it would be good to understand what um, at uh, Vancouver Airport, Shay, how, how you are working with your retail partners there on, on the single use plastic elements and, and whether, as Tracy was um, uh, alluding to, you know, this investment in sustainable options, whether it's the bags or the merchandise um, that is more sustainable, whether you, you as an airport and your uh, um, tenants are using that as an opportunity for the staff to tell that good news story. Oh, we are uh, certainly working very hard on our single-use plastic uh, work at, at this time. We have been actually since 2019, uh, but then obviously COVID came and things have gotten quite substantially quieter, but now we're um, working further with some of the single-use plastics. One of the things that uh, you know, we're trying to do is move away from plastics altogether at the front of house. I know Melanie was speaking about the front of house materials, and it's certainly at, at, uh, at face value with our, with our customers and our passengers. And back in 2017, we did a materiality study. And one of the things that came up is certainly people were just, you know, didn't really like the, the single use plastics and how much was being used in the terminal. We were all very well, very well aware of it, but you know, there just needs to be this transition. So we've been working hard with, uh, you know, with, but since 2019, we were pushing our tenants to move in this direction, but there's always this cost pro, you know, uh, cost issue that has, has popped up. Now, fast forward to 2021, we're implementing a single-use uh, plastic plan to get rid of all the front of house materials where possible, which is almost everything you can do. And even with the plant plastics, we don't want any of the bioplastics. You know, one of the things that I think retailers and our food and beverage uh, partners need to understand is uh, a lot of this, the materials that are used in facilities such as uh, YVR here as you know, once there's waste generated, it's local waste, and it needs to be it needs to be uh, handled locally. And each uh, local area has their requirements of what goes into their industrial composting facilities, what can be recycled, what materials can be recycled, what can go to landfill. Uh, so a lot of, um, you know, so we're being driven in a very uh, narrow area. So we've got a very robust plan with options for our tenants and helping them along the way because uh, you know there's so much stuff out there that you could easily get confused. So this is another one that's forging further partnerships is just trying to help uh, our tenants map their way through this maze of all these materials that exist out there. Where there are cost implications, so Michael, where there are cost implications regarding uh, materials or certain solutions um, that uh, you're, you're looking at, be it um, retailers, operators, suppliers, um, who's really driving the partnership approach? 
uh, at this stage? Is it the retailers, the operators, the suppliers, and other stakeholders? Is it a combination of, of all of them? I'd quite like to put that question to Hugo, actually. What's your take, Hugo, on uh, the who's driving the partnership dialogue? Uh, obviously, if I'm not mistaken, you have moved to for your own operations at ODG to uh, CO2 neutrality, but indeed you've worked with um, the different partners, operators, retailers and brands to devise sustainable um, design and build solutions. So just tell us a little bit about these um, and where the partnerships have proven critical in the implementation. Yeah, thank you very much. Are you able to see the screen I'm sharing right now? I just want to share something quickly because that's on the topic. Uh, can you see the screen I'm sharing? Yeah, we can see. Okay, great. Because uh, just to, to, to jump on what was said about the cost of the sustainable solutions and so on. Uh, at the moment, our team in the UK is delivering a pilot store. I cannot disclose right now for whom, because it's still confidential, but stay tuned, it will be announced very soon, which is a pilot, something quite simple. It's the most sustainable backward for a liquor brand. And they have really looked at all the angles from the materials, manufacturing, packaging, transportation, installation, end of life, and not only looking at the CO2 footprint, but at, at the use of plastic and petrochemicals, at the use of recycled materials, not recyclable, recycled, which makes a huge difference, and the biodegradability. And, 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 and by doing this exercise, as you can see on the right, we managed to, to have a 100% match on the visual equity, 100% match on the quality, but the cost is 30% higher. And the reason behind is because of the sourcing of the sustainable materials. Just uh, in our industry, we, we all know quite well the, the MDF, which is uh, mainly the most important component of most of the carcass of our permanent furniture. Sourcing sustainable fire-rated MDF is extremely expensive because there is no scale. And if together we all move to sourcing the right materials, we will build scale that will drive costs down. And I think that's really a, a big move that the, the forging partnership can allow us to do, is to all agree on on, on, on sourcing the right materials to bring the cost down. And that will have, I think, a direct and very strong impact on sustainable GTR. The, the, the other point I wanted to, uh, to mention is, uh, is, is yes, it, it's great to look at our projects and it's great to look at what we do uh, uh, inside the airports. And, and, but we believe uh, we should first look at ourselves and sustainability start with our own commitments. So to build on what you are saying, look, it's uh, yes, at, at ODG and now part of Altavia Travel Retail, we have now reached carbon neutrality in our own operations. But more than that, we, we, our group is Equovadi certified, which is maybe today the most European uh, recognized way to, 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 to rate sustainability of your organization. Also, I, I invite everyone to join the UN Global Compact, which is a pact. It's not a rating, it's a pact where you kind of commit to sustainable and as well as to uh, socially responsible practices. And we are part of the 8% global companies that have this advanced level. So we are not proud to be part of this only 8% because there should be much more than 8% of the global companies that should join this pact. And, and uh, refuse, refuse single-use plastic, that's a partnership we did here in Dubai with Lagarde Travel Retail at the time, which was to refuse all single-use plastic in our own operations. And, uh, and, uh, but moving forward and to answer your question about how maybe we can together and collectively be stronger in, in sustainability. I think we should, we should also try to avoid reinventing the wheel because uh, sustainability, and, and I speak only for the part we know, which is the physical environment, which are the stores, the POSM, permanent or temp temporary. So this is what we know. We, I don't know about uh, single-use plastic and so on. I think the sustainability is such a vast topic that we should try to, to, to stick to, to, to our expertise. And, and for me, really trying not to reinvent the wheel is to look at existing standards. Uh, LEED, for example, was mentioned by Tracy here. And I think it's great when airports are, are not, uh, yes, imposing standards because it allows us to all follow the right same direction. Currently, we work on several tenders, some are very uh, uh, well-known tenders at the moment, concession tenders, where basically there are no guidance uh, from the airport owner. They just say, you have to come up with sustainable solutions as part of your technical package. But this is too broad. And I think if we were working on more structured and existing guidance, such as the LEED uh, 
uh, criteria that will allow us also to be much more efficient. However, and sense of place is a big word in our industry, and, and I think sustainability should come with a sense of place. And in some part of the world, electricity uh, production might be sustainable. So the, the consumption of our stores might not be such a big issue. But maybe in this part of the world where we grow, the sourcing of the right materials is an issue. So that's where we should focus. Or maybe this, this, this project is on a beautiful island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and they are flooded with plastic every day. So maybe we should focus our attention on this. So yes, look at global standards, but yes, sustainability with a sense of place. So I think that's really a, what I wanted to share with you today is, is a, um, together, thanks to our procurement strategy, focusing on the right materials, we can bring costs down because today doing a really sustainable project has a cost. And from our experience, it's a cost of 30%. And also looking at maybe a global standard that allow us to all work in the, work in the same direction will help, but with a sense of place. So that's, that's what I wanted to contribute about uh, the answering your question, Luke. Thanks very much for that, uh, Hugo. You obviously referenced green store design uh, there. Um, I wanted to ask you, are you uh, at ODG seeing more evidence of sustainability criteria embedded into uh, tenders, RFPs, or even as a, a prerequisite um, for bid submissions? We received some responses to our sustainability survey, uh, as I mentioned a little earlier, um, and there seems to be quite some interesting debate uh, around uh, the status of um, bid submissions as they are at the moment. Obviously, they will vary differently from, from airport to airport, but um, what stage we are at really in this life cycle of um, asking uh, tenderers to include as a prerequisite some credentials as part of their bid submissions. Is this something that you, you are seeing increasing? Yeah, so right now we work on two tenders, which includes sustainable, sustainable criteria from, from, the, from, the, from the RFP. Uh, one of them has clearly identified one criteria, which is the ability to reuse the existing premises, which I think is maybe the first step if you want to be sustainable is to reuse what's in place rather than to demolish and rebuild. So definitely that the, the, more, the more directions are given in the RFP, the better, because we can then come up with the right recommendation. So I think the RFP is, and it's quite new, that in the past we didn't see that many, that many kind of uh, sustainable criteria in RFP, which is great. It's great that the airport are stepping up and say, now, if you want to win this concession, you have to prove that you are coming up with sustainable solutions. I think the next step is to give more guidance which is what Tracy was saying with Estidama. Estidama in Abu Dhabi is great. It's extremely uh, difficult for the brands, for the operators. And, and I know that Tracy and uh, Melanie have been through this and it, it's very, very difficult and it, it comes with a cost. However, this airport might be the most sustainable GTR project ever because they have given guidance. And I think this is what we need is to all work with the, some sort of guidance and global standards, not reinventing the wheel. They are LEED, for example, LEED certification works really well. Why? Because retailers have adopted LEED all around the world. Nike flagship stores around the world, a lot of them are LEED certified. Starbucks all around the world, a lot of them are LEED certified. It works for the retail industry. You have maybe half a dozen of duty-free stores LEED certified, most of them in Asia. I think this is a certification that we could leverage on Adapting it to a sense of place and adapting it to travel retail specifications, it will make sense. And, and, and us on our side, our technical managers, our creative designers are now lead certified because they have followed the courses and they passed the exam. And that's what we think is uh, this should be actionable, but also built on uh, existing standards. It would be good to throw that question to Shay as well, Luke, um, to understand, you know, you, Shay, you mentioned the partnership approach accompanying, guiding your tenants uh, through this maze, as you mentioned earlier on. Um, what about not just at Vancouver Airport uh, with regards to the tender documents and, and, and new RFPs? Uh, at Vancouver, will you be sort of um, focusing more on the sustainability benchmarks, working with your commercial retail colleagues in incorporating more sustainability benchmarks in those RFP documents? And firstly, for Vancouver, but secondly, are you talking with other airports about what 
um, Hugo was referring to having sort of a benchmark and a reference of, of guidelines to so there there is some sort of standard criteria on in, increased sustainability benchmarks uh, across the board, not just at Vancouver, but other Canadian and North American airports, for example. Well, uh, we, we certainly have standards at the airport. Um, we have uh, when, when a tenant RFP uh, submits an RFP, there are certain sustainability, it's a big component of uh, submitting your RFP, everything from looking at energy, waste, water use, uh, even ecosystem health, because that's one of our pillars as well, how you can support those. So those are just an, a, a number of the uh, components of the RFP process. Um, and then we also provide documentation on what they need to do to supply their store. So, you know, I, I focus on waste. That's my area of expertise. You know, we do provide them uh, procurement guidelines as to what kind of products they uh, can procure for their facilities. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we do speak with airports, you know, the Canadian airports uh, is a part of a larger group uh, with ACI North America. And then also we have our own uh, Canadian airport council as well, where we discuss sustainability initiatives. Um, but if there's a, a, like a standard pro standard across the board for airports, not, not within uh, Canada or North America, but these things are very much discussed and everybody's trying to achieve, you know, the same end result, which is, you know, reducing energy. Uh, reducing water use and uh, and um, diverting waste from landfill. Thanks, Shay. I think Melanie wanted to comment there as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I, I was uh, I was really uh, willing also to uh, to uh, to well to to say how much aligned I was also with what Shay and uh, Hugo was uh, were saying because uh, yes, it could be such a it's so difficult and it could be. Uh, yes, such so, uh, such a mess, you know, to uh, to find our way in all these uh, different ways to uh, to do things uh, that we absolutely need to be aligned on the norm on standards. And if uh, if it leads, it's perfect. But uh, yes, we cannot reinvent the wheel each time we we are answering a, a tender because it's it's. It's too difficult, and uh, at, at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, we need to accelerate. We need to go fast, and so we cannot uh, spend too much time to uh, <laughs> to, re to reinvent uh, uh, everything uh, each time. So I think it's really crucial when we talk about partnership. I think it's a perfect illustration uh, of that. Uh, same, uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe it's, uh, it will be a topic we will. Uh, we will uh, tackle later on, but uh, it's also uh, linked also with some other things linked to plastic again. But um, the different, uh, you know, uh, decisions that some uh, some uh, airports can take about about plastic and about uh, plastic bottles, for example. Uh, you know, should we suppress plastic bottles? Uh, should we have uh, only uh, cans, aluminium cans? Uh, in uh, you know in our assortments, uh, no one is completely uh, aligned on that, and so uh, but we we won't be able to to afford you know having in one airport in San Francisco for example no more plastic bottles but uh, but yes plastic bottles in uh, Los Angeles <laughs> and uh, you know and the same all around the world it's not possible so we need also to 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 be all aligned and to find. Yes, the, the right standards, and uh, and for time being, as it said, it has already been mentioned uh, in another session. Uh, no one really knows, so uh, we need, but uh, we cannot do uh, tests and trials uh, in each and every airport. That's for sure. While we're on the topic of these sustain sustainability requirements, a question come in from the audience is: um, Do these requirements focus just on greenhouse gases and circularity, or choice of material? Or do they also include social criteria like living wages, employee social protection, and so on? Because obviously, sustainability is not just about the environment; it's the broader, it's the broader topic, uh, as mentioned in that question. Um, do, do you want to take that one, Melanie, while you're on the panel? No, yes, for sure. Uh, pleasure. No, for sure. For us, it's very, uh, very important too. And uh, uh, so, in uh, our our CSR policy, we have a, we have a, a specific name for our, our project, so PEPS. So uh, PEPS with the P for planet, uh, E for ethics, P for people, and S for social. And this S is uh, very, very important for us. It's everything linked also with uh, our local communities, how we can. Uh, 
uh, how we can leverage these uh, these local communities, how we can support them, how we can uh, how we can focus all our donations also to the local uh, communities. Uh, so it's something very uh, very important for us. Uh, it's something on which we are also working. Thanks to we are talking about standards. Uh, Ecovadis is another is another way to deal with that, and of course this uh, social uh, aspect is also included in uh, in the Ecovadis uh, ratings, and uh, it's also something we are using uh, in uh, in uh, for in our E of ethics also uh, to to be able to score our suppliers and to raise the bar also on this uh, on this topic. So Thank yes, you. of course, very important. Thank, thanks, Melanie. And, and Tracy, is that something uh, both you're discussing with your supplier partners, but also something you're seeing coming from airport partners as well? Um, yes, in fact, it's something we've just we've recently um, launched our um, SDGs, and it's something that's written into our policy as well. Um, not only supporting local CSR programs, but sourcing of materials and products from the local market to support local economies. I think that's very, very important as well. Um, hiring of local resources to work on your project within the operation. So in addition to your CSR programs, so it's um, materials, product, CSR programs. So yes, definitely something we are looking at. Hugo, you wanted to say something then? Yeah, just uh, from our experience right now, the a uh, very important tender in Scandinavia, which is going on right now. I'm sure you guys know what we are talking about. Uh, in the requirements, uh, there is definitely a component about people. So it's not, a bit, not only sustainability, but planet. It's also about people. And lead, for example, is people, planet, profit. It's the three Ps. And, and uh, just for your information, in, in our group, we have a foundation, which uh, also is about people, because this foundation is about micro-retail and supporting uh, 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 people who are in poverty to go into the retail business and help them setting up their own micro retail business. So definitely the people component seems to be very well encompassed in the sustainability. Thanks, Hugo. Keen to bring a supplier perspective in at this point. Caroline at, uh, at Coty, perhaps you can talk a little bit about the key pillars of, of Coty's strategy when it comes to sustainability fundamentally. What are you as a company doing differently compared to some of your beauty competitors? Can you hear, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, okay. Sorry, um, sorry for that. So um, obviously um, um, at Koti, and, and first of all, you're not talking about sustainability in general, um, sustainability is clearly for us the ultimate driver uh, of business and innovations in, in the future and, and now as well. And we are very fortunate to have our CEO, Sunabi, uh, for whom sustainability is clearly on top of the, of the agenda. Now, through and within the 117 years of our history uh, at Koti, we have developed great expertise uh, when it comes to science, innovations, R&D. And uh, what we made it, uh, what we made our mission is uh, to continue and invest with sustainability in, on top of our minds and make sure that sustainability is always at the heart of all our products, innovations and across the organization. Now, um, with this in mind, in 2020, we actually launched our dedicated sustainability uh, strategy called Beauty That Lasts. Um, this strategy is built actually around three uh, key pillars. The first pillar is around our products uh, and the beauty of our products, uh, driving product innovations in a way that is sustainable and going towards the circular economy. The second pillar uh, uh, for us is really the planet and protecting, of course, natural resources towards achieving a healthy, safe and, and clean environment. Now, the third pillar, and you have mentioned it before, uh, that is very important, is maybe a bit different from, from how companies are, are, are seeing it, is really our people and making sure that we are creating a more inclusive business and of course, a more inclusive society. Now, I know that these areas are not only important to us, uh, they're also important to our consumers, uh, to associates, to our partners across the globe and stakeholders. And this is where I believe we can have the biggest, uh, the biggest impact. Now to achieve um, all the sustainability ambitions that we have, 
Um, we need, we know that we cannot do it on our own. I mean, we really need to work in full partnership uh, with the many companies and organizations. Um, you, you'll see it on the next slide. These are some of them we are, are working uh, with today and really making full use of the expertise they're offering to improve the way that we operate uh, and shape all our plans. Um, I also would like to add that the way that we approach sustainability goals uh, differ according to the category. So you're going to treat the other ones very differently from the way you're going to treat the facial moisturizer when it comes to sustainability and product life cycle. But I think the overall approach is very much guided by our beauty that lasts um, strategy today. Um, I would also like to add something very important is that sustainability and becoming a full sustainable uh, organization is, is a long term journey. It's really not something that, ha can, that can happen in one day. And we know that we're going to see so many more innovation and so many more technologies coming in, in the next few years, um, especially when you're looking at the areas of um, um, sustainable packaging, uh, clean ingredients, responsible supply chain. Um, there needs to be a continued progress uh, across the board and, and over time. Thanks very much, Caroline. You mentioned there sustainability uh, being a full-time journey uh, for Coty. And obviously you're pushing the envelope at the moment. We reported on trbusiness.com uh, exclusively in a world exclusive this morning, the news that Lancaster Suncare Line has received the, the silver uh, C2C material health certificate from Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. Um, but perhaps more specifically, you partnered with Lanzatech recently um, on some exciting developments regarding um, uh, introducing sustainable ethanol uh, from carbon captured emissions into your fragrances. Just talk us through the significance of that for the company, but importantly, uh, for the environment. No, thank you. Thank you for mentioning Lancaster and thank you for your questions about Lanzatech. Just a few words about Lanzatech. Uh, first, it is today the pioneer in the production of the next generation of sustainable ingredients. The partnership that we have with them has been going on for the last two years and has been really focused on developing absolutely breakthrough and innovative technology which is for me a critical step in becoming a circular business. And it is the perfect example for me today of the ultimate upcycling. Um, the partnership that we have with Lanzatech has led to the development and production of a highly purified ethanol that is made from carbon captured emission and can be used in all our fine fragrances. This is a major, again, technological uh, breakthrough with big implications to, to the beauty industry. Now, what is ethanol? Ethanol is a vital ingredient in the production of fragrances. Actually, ethanol is making 80 to 90% of the, of the finished product. Now, in becoming a more circular business, you know, um, this is really the perfect example of, of the ultimate um, uh, upcycling. Um, the partnership with Lanzatech has led the, to, to that uh, great um, technology that we are seeing in here. And it's uh, actually the ingredient. I mean, if you look today at ethanol today, it is really the ingredient that has the largest economical impact for Koti, most notably because it has the largest uh, water consumption and, and land uh, usage, um, because natural ethanol is made from crops like sugar beets. Now with Coty being the worldwide leader in fragrances, it became absolutely crucial to find a more sustainable way to produce ethanol. Now, just imagine that instead of having to use crops that could be used for, for food, humans and animals, instead of using millions of gallons of water to produce ethanol, we could actually capture carbon emissions, which would otherwise go into the atmosphere in the form of greenhouse gases like CO2, and transform them into a highly purified ethanol that can be used in all fine fragrances by the likes of Gucci's and Burberry's, Marc Jacobs and more. We will actually be the first company uh, in the industry today to use ethanol that is made of captured carbon emissions in our fragrance products, which requires almost none uh, water consumption and significantly lowers the impact that Coty has on, on the environment. Now, I would like to show you a graph uh, of how um, the purified ethanol is, is being produced. Um, as you can see here, instead of using crops and, and going through the traditional gasification product, 
what we're doing is that uh, we are actually taking directly from, um, from industries, I mean, waste gases that come in the forms of CO and, and CO2, and we are cleaning that and going through a fermentation process that is very similar to how alcohol is being, uh, is being made to make the ethanol, okay? So that's clearly something that uh, none has done before and is giving us a high, a very highly purified ethanol can be used, that can be used in, um, in, in fragrances. So this is really a unique technology for me, the one that would have the most impact today on, uh, on the beauty industry, okay? Now I have to say this, um, this great innovation has had great resonance uh, across the globe. Um, as you can see here, we got so much of uh, medias and social media coverage to that, I mean, which is great because that really helps to elevate the awareness and the importance of, uh, of, of what we have been doing to, uh, to limit our impact on the environment. And, uh, and clearly, you know, is, is a great uh, tribute, you know, to the, uh, to the great uh, partnership that we have with Brisland Tech today. Well, what's the consumer reaction been to the Lanza Tech partnership, Caroline. Can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of that and ultimately how you see it underlying the future success of your of your products commercially? Yeah. So, so consumer generally, I mean, as you know, I mean, there, there is a growing demand today from consumers to really understand what is going behind the product. Actually, consumers have been extremely knowledgeable on products. Not they don't they don't want to know only about the appearance or the function of the product, but they want to know how the product was produced. They want to know what ingredients have been used and what is the environmental impact of, of the product. And it's really up to the brands, it's really up to us to meet and exceed those expectations by being very transparent and by delivering the information in a very clear and, and compelling way. Um, you can see today consumers, and these are mainly uh, the Gen Zs and, and the millennials who really consider sustainability as a key factor in, in the purchasing decisions. Um, interestingly, in, in China, I mean, and I just read this um, very recently, um, the use of ethical material has become only second after product quality when it comes to, to preferences. So there is a huge opportunity here, a huge commercial opportunity, because if you, if you can find the perfect mix between an outstanding product that is sustainable and in, in addition comes from a, a beloved brand, then you really have a, a clear winner. Okay, so I think this is, a, this is clearly where, um, where you, know, you, you can win. Um, for me, you know, our products really represent our sustainability ambitions that are brought to life. Um, and in this context, and you have mentioned Lancaster before, I am extremely proud today to, to make an exclusive announcement uh, that was just shared in, in the press this morning. And, um, and it is about Lancaster. So Lancaster Skincare and our Suncare line uh, named Sun Sensitive that has been awarded with the prestigious material health certificates at the silver level from the Credit to Credit Product Innovation Institute. Now, this is, these are very strict criteria, and, and this award indicates that 100% of the ingredients used in Lancaster are actually meeting the Institute very strict criteria. Now, Lancaster Sun Sensitive is, is just in general, you know, a, a, a clean vegan range, and it is today the most environmentally friendly uh, line that we have in, in Lancaster range. Um, the collection provides a broad spectrum uh, protection against the sun, has minimalistic uh, vegan formula and contains 40% less uh, of ingredients, okay? Now, just to summarize this, uh, of course, product cannot only be sustainable. We need to make sure that they also provide the benefits. They also provide the level of safety that our consumers are expecting and are waiting for. And this is why it takes such a great investment, times and expertise uh, to get it right. Uh, we know that it's not the easy way uh, to create new product, but it is really uh, included the right way. Caroline, you, you mentioned that um, you find it, for you it's very important to communicate the sustainable values of the products to the consumers, and you mentioned that uh, Chinese in particular are placing a high level of importance on the on the sustainable values. But concretely, how do you communicate those sustainable values to the consumer? Is it through the packaging? Is it through technology? Is it through social media? Uh, what what's what's the um, the, the best means you've found to communicate these values to consumers? It's, it's a very good question. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, obviously media and social media is playing a very a very crucial part. I mean, um, in China, as, as an example, you know, this is very widely, uh, this is a media that is very widely used. Uh, we do it through uh, promotions and communication that we do on our point of sale uh, as well, where we highlight uh, the uh, sustainability of, of our products. That's, that's, that's one area. 
and uh, and of course we do it during trainings um, and uh, official communications that we have with with our consumers. Thanks, Carol. Uh, Luke, I think we um, probably time we brought in Richard then and Mondelez. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Please, Richard, if you can perhaps elucidate a bit more on the importance of what Mondelez are doing uh, in the partnership field, Copa Life Program, packaging innovation, and that crucial collaboration with Circle Square. And we have Abby here today to speak about a very exciting project. So, Richard, I'll hand over to you at this point. Absolutely, thank you, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, going straight in, I assume you can. You can see my screen. So uh, at Mondelez World Travel Retail, we have uh, two, two parts to our approach. So we have the corporate initiatives here. So that's about making the most of the scale of the, the wider company, wider Mondelez International, and that's implementing those relevant programs in World Travel Retail. So Coco Sustainability, we have our, our own program called Coco Life, which is, of course, a, a very important topic for us in, in confectionery. You can see that's a, a significant investment and where you have a uh, where you have a target there of 100% by 2025. We're at 99% in world travel retail already, by the way. So we're making great progress here. I can also actually announce uh, today a, a new piece of news, which is a partnership with Olam Foods, and they're a world-leading supplier of cocoa beans on a new collaboration to create the world's single largest sustainable commercial cocoa farm in Indonesia. And that's a real demonstration of intent, I think, uh, in this area. So... So we have uh, sustainable ingredients. Uh, we have packaging innovation as, as well, of course, as a responsible brand owner. We, of course, need to innovate to deliver more effective packaging solutions for the planet. right? And, uh, and all the packaging uh, that we use will either be recyclable or recycle ready by 2025. And, and we're at 93% right now. So we're making great progress here. We're also, apart from the materials we're using, we're also looking at optimizing the pack formats uh, on a number of our key ranges right now. And that's about actively considering packaging material in the conversations that we're having as we're making those, those decisions. Reducing headspace is a big thing for us as well to make sure we're only using the packaging that we really need on our, on our product. So these are the corporate-wide pledges, I guess, that we're committed to, to driving through in, in world travel retail. But of, uh, of relevance to this discussion, the more, I guess, it is uh, our exploration, I guess, and the process of, of how we... Uh, uh, came about the difference that we can make in travel retail. We're part of a, a beautiful industry here with a number of, of, of specificities, I guess. But so we took quite some time to consider how we can operate in a way that's that's kinder to the planet and simply how we can be better, how we can just be better. So as we looked at this, we we identified in store to build on, on Hugo's point, actually, as, as a key opportunity for us in, in travel retail for improvement. And you can see a number of initiatives on on the screen here i share you can see from the bottom left we're talking about we spend a lot of time thinking now about tracking upcycling and, and repurposing our existing material to, to prolong life and encourage circularity of our in-store furniture we make hundreds of these units uh, a year and we've uh, we can already point to a number of examples in europe mainly uh, but also the middle east over the last few months even where we've reused furniture whereas before it in honesty we may well have scrapped and produced new uh move, moving further on fewer better gifts with purchase uh obviously taking more using more sustainable materials in the items that we give away to add value to the to the product you can see in the bottom right this little little flash a, a small example of some of the new technologies uh that we're we're trialing in store for for say uh, for sustainable uh, uh use you, you see here a small uh, small shelf talker that's highlighting uh total range ginger ale and jar a new flavor and that uses small bulbs that are not powered by uh, the mains or powered by batteries that go to landfill this actually uses solar panels that draw light from this from in store from the in-store environment which is actually a little bit more complicated than it sounds but uh this is fantastic because it's very self uh self it's self-running and there's there's no race here which is which is great uh top right you can see uh the ethical promotions that we're looking at we're, we're having a number of conversations putting plans in place to uh, add additional elements that add value to the purchase that enable travellers to, to make sustainable choices, and whether that's giving away seed packets, planting trees, whatever that is, uh, trying to help travellers to make, to make better uh, choices. But from the, the partnership perspective on the top left, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about the materials that we can use in our branded in-store furniture. As I say, we make hundreds of these on a yearly basis. And we came to the conclusion that while we, that we understand that to, to the point already been made that some material restrictions exist for very good reasons in our environment 
we, we wanted to explore how we could do better. So we have a very close collaboration with our design partners, Circle Square, and uh, and we took the challenge to Abby and, and, and her team. And the result that, that came from this work, this partnership was a, a sustainability framework or a scorecard, we're calling it. And that, what that does is that, that informs and it, I guess, validates our collective design decisions. And it pushes us towards more sustainable retail practices and helps to make us more accountable for those as well. So that's something that we've been we've been working quite a lot on, and we're we're quite proud of actually. But what I'll do is, if that's all all right, I'll uh, let Abby talk uh, to that point a little bit more in detail uh, on the scorecard, if that's okay. Absolutely, Abby, please. Thank Go you, ahead. thanks, Richard. Thanks for taking us through that. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think as travel retail experts, Circle Square, we, we know full well the restrictions with, with materiality choices that we can make. And sometimes there aren't obvious choices that we can swap in some of those uh, materials that we use. It, it's not always an obvious uh, thing to do. So it's a big challenge. And when Richard came to us with the challenge, it, you know, it's pretty daunting, but I think we had to start somewhere. And what we really wanted to do was show that uh, sustainable design could be as groundbreaking and beautiful and that we could still deliver that really creative, disruptive and engaging design that we that we come to know and love in travel retail. We want to be engaging for the consumer and we don't want to sacrifice the equity of a brand just because the, the design or the, the outcome is more sustainable. That shouldn't be an either or, it should be a, an altogether. Um, we just need to take those really important factors of, of travel retail design, retail design, and we need to think about them in another way and really centralise uh, sustainability as our core message. So how did we do that? If we can flip to the next slide please Richard. Um, how did we do that? Together we, we recognised that there was no playbook to do this, there was no rule book that we could just all open together and go right this is what we do, this is something that we had to kind of work out together um, and therein comes the partnership because this was not a linear brief, this was not a Mondelez to circle square, you must do this, and equally, and not a circle square to Mondelez, okay, here's how we do it. It had to be a really open, transparent conversation with, with both of us. And we've worked really hard with our teams to get, to get where we are. Um, and we think a really good way to, to solve complex problems is to start looking at, you know, inward. What are we doing at the moment? What's our output? Um, so we did a really good analysis of a, a case study, the Tobler and War Bay, which you see there on the left-hand side of the slide. It's very standard. I'm sure all of us have seen that War Bay in lots of different airports all over the world. Um, so we started there and we thought, okay, well, if we break that down into how that unit is made, what material choices we've had, we can start to sort of build a picture of literally what that wall bay is made of. And once we know those materials, we can start scoring the material choices as well on how they perform against four really key criteria that we identified as being really important, which are recyclability, reusability, availability, and end of life. Um, and by doing that, we can start to put together a sustainable DNA rating of our unit because we can weight those materials against how they're used in the makeup of a, of a stock unit. And it gives us a really clear picture of what we're doing at the moment. Um, and that we found that if we cross and um, analyze against different brands in different airports, that the average we're coming out at at the moment is about a four out of five. And that's because mainly we are using really old or habitual ways of working that we recognize need to be modified because they put emphasis on things like really high impact materials which have low or zero ability to be recycled that perhaps it isn't a plan for second life for anything you know it's it's as Richard said we are all guilty of putting stock units in which come out a few months later if it's a promotion and maybe they're not reused and that needs to stop we need to think about how we're, we're giving things a second life and we need to be really mindful about design stages so we're designing with sustainability in mind so it can come all the way through that when we put it in store we know that that unit is going to be durable there for a long time and the material choices that we've made are, are, are sensible with a sustainable mindset um, so we've, we've looked at our, our, our sdna of units we've seen that four out of five is kind of the average um, our score out of five is higher, is more high impact, low out of five. So one out of five is a really low impact. That's where we want to go. So road mapping that into making new decisions. How do we get to a, a better place where we can start being proud to say that the units that we're putting into store are averaging a two to three out of five instead of a, a four or higher. And we did that by changing the way that we design and introducing much lower impact substitution materials and researching into new greener materials as well. Something that Hugo touched on, I think it was really important. You know, we, we all use the same materials, but actually if we're all in this together and we want to, to introduce new green materials, then why not let's do that as partnerships together. 
Um, we also need to design to last. So we want to see things in store for much longer. And we want to have them the flexibility that they can still have the wow factor, even if they've been in store for a few years. So we still want to inject that life and give something really engaging to retailers and that wow factor to consumers as well. But we just want to be really mindful about our, our choices at the very first stage and at every stage onwards as well. And it's just been a great collaboration. I think, you know, we've needed both insight from brand, from retailer, from, from us as retail design experts, we need to do this together. It's not something that we need to own. So not, not just from a business perspective, but you know, Richard and I want to sleep better at night and know that we've made really good decisions about the, the stuff that we're putting into store. So it's been a great partnership so far. Thanks for that. Point. I just started, Luke. I was just going to say, partnership has been raised, uh, obviously, in other sessions as well, and came out, out a lot in the beauty session as well. But the importance of partnerships and competitors working together, um, uh, you know, not just brands, uh, but also retailers, uh, and of course, you, the design companies. Hugo's got his hand up. So, a question to Abby and Hugo: Is this something where, yes, you will collaborate with your competitors and other retail design companies? Hugo, excuse me. What is your question? <laughs> the question is partnership, working with competitors for greater sustainable um, achievements uh, is really important, um, not just partnerships between brands and retailers and so on, but also um, across competitors. Is this something that um, ODG Altavir is, uh, is open to as well, sharing information and partnership with, co with competi competition? I, I think the, the effort we have to do collectively is so big that we have to collaborate regardless if we are competitors or not. And I think we might have a set that uh, Circle, Quest, Circle Squad do not have and vice versa in the competition. I don't think the, the question is really there. Is how can we all contribute? The topic is so huge. And, and, and I really like what, uh, what Caroline and, uh, and Richard were saying about uh, the, the consumer and Gen Z, who is buying not only with their wallet, but they're also buying with their values right now. And, and I think it's a huge opportunity for travel retail to regain trust and because i mean duty free sometimes have this image of being sometimes over expensive and you don't understand why they are called duty free anymore and and why do you need to shop and i think now we can really regain this trust by by putting forward the effort we are doing and and in the in the in the recent design we are doing for for airports we really bring life to the sustainability in a fun way it doesn't need to be boring I think it's great. We can create nice touch points, nice corners dedicated to sustainable solutions where we create a new opportunity for excitement because this Gen Z is excited about sustainability. So what can we do to make them excited and make the, the, the duty-free fun and enticing through the lens of sustainability? And that requires creativity. So if the team of Circle Square is creative, great, let them be creative about sustainability. We are, so let's all be creative about sustainability. And that, that's what we want. As tomorrow, we want them to have fun about sustainability, buy the right product at the right price. It's wonderful to see the screen that we can see here because we can see all the speakers all nodding their heads in agreement with what you're saying. Tracy, I'm going to pick on you because you, you were the first I've noticed nodding away that what Hugo was saying. Um, obviously, the excitement, but coming back to the original question as well, is, is um, partnership and um, collaboration with competition something that Ariantra will consider here as well in sustainability? Yeah, absolutely. So as I was saying earlier on, is that the um, learnings that we've gained from the Abu Dhabi airport have been huge, which we ourselves are looking to adopt. But as you work with different design agency, the likes of Hugo or Abby, you gain experience from these guys as well. Um, and great to hear what the suppliers are doing. So Richard, I mean, fabulous initiatives there. And I think we as the retailer then start gathering all this information together and it becomes part of our sustainability DNA when we are going out um, you know, to tender for new projects. So, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very interesting, it's a very interesting to hear from, you know, from Abby and Hugo looking at you know, recycling of furniture. For me, what's always killed me over the years is the, um, the speed at which brands change furniture. You come up with this view, these beautiful designs and two years later, they pulled out and binned. Um, and if you have a good structure there, um, and yes, if the DNA of the material is sustainable, but when we're designing or when you guys are designing, look at ways of maintaining the structure and then simply refreshing, cleaning and replacing panels rather than stripping out the furniture. So I think it's gonna be a collective approach of us all learning from each other. Um, as I said earlier, very important that it filters down from government level, from airports, 
down into the retail operators and then us all collectively um, inputting our knowledge into a pool and certainly sharing that information. Um, and, and Abu Dhabi, again, as an example, is demonstrating where we as concessionaires are coming together as a team with the um, airport sustainability team, sharing information. So ourselves and Lagadere are working together on um, you know, sourcing alternative plastics. So gone are the days where you hold that information to yourself. You now get together around the sustainability table and you start sharing for the greater good of the project, the region and the planet as a whole. I think if we were in a live session here in a physical environment, you'd have everybody applauding you there, uh, Tracy, on that one. Great to hear. Richard, you've got your hand up. You wanted to comment there. Yeah, sure. It's just to, to, to the partnership point. It's just on there, the scorecard that we shared there, that was, as Abby was explaining, there was no playbook for this. So we we initially, the initial idea was actually to go outside and get this accredited, right, and get this uh, externally verified. And, and from conversation with a number of parties, they came to us and said, look, there is no the playbook for this we, we, we can't accredit it which is which is great which i guess shows the value in the work but what we'd also like you to do is is be very open abby and ourselves and, and share this scorecard and because this is quite a lot of work so anyone who wants to come and uh, uh and understand exactly how we built the scorecard how we uh, measure the units that we do we're very very open to share all of the work that we've done because i think only by uh, only by being open and collaborating do we do we genuinely get better on this topic Thanks, Richard. That's a really important point. And that's what this event is all about as well is, you know, educating the industry. And we've seen, you know, in all the conversations we've had on sustainability, there's there's none of this, as you saying, Tracy, cards to jest attitude. It's really, you know, all the uh, companies are, are really willing to share. Um, there, there's a really interesting partnership model. Uh, so, Tracy, Tracy, you're on. Go ahead, Tracy. Could I add to, to, to an important point um, and the and the benefit of sharing the information um, is we mentioned earlier on about met, being met with resistance because of the cost that sustainability adds to a project, cost and time. And the more we share the information and the quicker we all get on the same page, the quicker the costs will start to, da to come down. And the more that we're familiar with the process, the faster we will be able to deliver projects. Because right now, and coming back to the RFP stage, when an airport and if an airport does write processes into the bid, time is always the essence. It's very different if you have a fast track project of six to nine months. Can you deliver on all your sustainability pro uh, promises in a short term um, delivery program versus when you have a 12 or a two year program. So time that will assist the time and cost element of the sharing of the information. Yeah. Leading up to drive down costs very much a point that Hugo spoke to, I believe earlier. Um, I just wanted to pick up on um, a question, quick question here for I think probably Abby and, and, and indeed um, Hugo to answer. Um, when it comes to sort of assessing in-store circularity, uh, furniture and, and fixtures uh, for activations or even permanent displays. Are there particular formats where greener solutions are, are easy to implement? Gondolas, wall bays, uh, freestanding units, um, both through the sourcing of materials, the transport, um, throughout the whole life cycle of those activations. Is there anything that you could recommend, um, Hugo, Abby, to that, uh, to that end? I'll take that, thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely, I think so. And I think we need to be looking at more local supply chains and, and not you know, shipping things all around the world. And, and again, it comes back to making choices with, with that in mind and not just choosing something because it's low cost and, and speedy or it's the most available. We've got to be thinking about localization of, of um, production and materiality and, and that durability that we were mentioning before. It's, it's the same as Tracy said, you know, as especially as a design agency, if we're designing something that's in for three months and then goes in landfill. It's actually heartbreaking from, from a, a personal perspective as well, as well as a planet perspective. We've got to be thinking longer term. So yes, we, I think we need to start by by localizing what we're doing, by giving the tools to local the team so that we can we can be consistent around the world and not just hold everything in one place. Also material, but also something that we can we can rebrand and reuse and repurpose um, because that's always going to be the greenest solution is to reuse what we've already got rather than producing new. Hugo, would you like to add 
uh, follow up to that? Yeah, I just want to share one example. Uh, if you can, if you can see, let me know when you can see what I'm sharing. Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, just because your previous question about was about knowledge sharing, and now you're about yeah, are there any best practices? I mean, we've been lucky enough at Altavia Group to work with L'Oreal Group, not L'Oreal Travel Retail only, but L'Oreal Group for nine years in 30 countries. And L'Oreal is not in the panel today, but they could really be there because in terms of eco-design POSM, they are very advanced uh, in, in all the channels. And, and because we work with them, we have really learned with them on, on what, they are, what are the playbooks to design eco point of sale materials, either temporary, which you're mentioning, or permanent. And there are some basic rules, what they call the the must-have, which is uh, separate materials for easy recyclability, uh, what percentage of the recycled material you are using, reduce the volume and the weight, because yeah, whatever you produce then needs to be shipped. The bigger, the heavier, the more CO2 footprint. And they have some rules like uh, when it's temporary, let's avoid electronics and let's avoid electricity. We can rely on the light on the ceiling to lead the product when it's a temporary activation. When it's permanent, we can. So there are some playbooks already developed and, and now, we have adapted those playbooks to GTR, uh, pre-qualifying library of materials. I think that's very important and we, we touched on it many times today. If we all have a, a pre-qualified list of materials that uh, we, we use, I'm not talking about the finishes, but the bare materials, then we can all apply the right finishes to suit our brand equity, but the materials, the carcass, and many of the electronic components could be very much similar to all of us, uh, reducing uh, very much the cost. And the last one, which is, one of the things also Abby was mentioning is to make the right decisions locally, because not everything can come from central and all our HQ might be very knowledgeable about sustainability, but maybe not the, the local offices in the different hubs globally. So eco-scoring will allow uh, the, the different uh, uh, stakeholders to make the right decisions between ma one material to another based on the score of this particular material. So we are now developing the eco-scoring uh, database that will allow everyone to use the right material based on the score this material is, is, is having. So I think, yes, there are some great knowledge that were shared by uh, L'Oreal Group and that we are using. And, and it's great if you are developing also uh, new, new playbooks with Mondelez, because that's what we need, knowledge sharing. And, and, and I think uh, there are, like we said before, let's not always reinvent the wheel. There are existing solutions, existing principles that really works. Thanks, Caroline. Mm -hmm. on, on, on this point. Caroline, you wanted to make yes. a comment? On yes, yes. Sorry, I wanted to make a point. And Marcus, if you can just display um, what we have done also around our POS, because I think that it's important to show as well that as a luxury industry, um, we can absolutely go in the same lines, you know, as what was discussed before. I really loved what, uh, what the audience said here. Um, I have to say, just as a company, as a luxury, uh, as a luxury business, we are definitely moving into, uh, in, moving into producing all our POS material and merchandising units with recyclable, reusable and modular material um, that are easy to personalize and flexible to adapt um, from a different uh, brand visuals and different brand codes. You can see the example of what we've done, for example, for Boss, uh, for a podium. And then on the other side, exactly the same podium, but again, visual changed and brand code changed, the, the units were cladded and that was it. So really here, you know, a way to reuse the material and still remaining extremely qualitative in the way that we display. I think that if you look at the next slide, uh, what you see in here as well, and this is a special collaboration that we had with Gucci brand, one of the uh, ultra luxurious uh, brands today. Um, the merchandise units we have built together are very easy to assemble, to transport and to reassemble um, and, and do not require any special tools. So we don't use glue. Uh, for example, on the, on the screws, we use a flat pack system where materials can actually be collapsed in a flat pack, easy to transport, and, and of course, uh, very easy to storage at, at, at quite low cost. Um, I, I just wanted to show you because this is a magnificent execution, and we worked uh, really in close collaboration with, with Gucci here. Uh, you can see in here that the, the quality of execution that you, you get with sustainable materials that have been reused you know, can remain the same. Um, and, and it's definitely not less than any other project that we have, uh, that we have done in, in the past. Okay, so just to highlight really that even in luxury, we can be top qualitative, you know, with sustainable materials that are being reused uh, time over time. Thanks, Caroline. There's a really um, interesting example of circularity that um, I want to um, uh, share to showcase. 
uh, we've been talking about, you know, <clears throat> reusing materials. Um, and this one is something which I, I think was Richard's talking about sense of place, which groups a bit of sense of place because Vancouver is obviously high population of um, Chinese uh, consumers and, and uh, the Chinese population. Che, do you want to talk us through the example that um, you've got a small video as well to share about uh, recyclable chopsticks? Yeah, so I, you know, one thing we tend to focus a lot on in uh, in waste management is uh, recycling, but we never really, you know, looking for opportunities for reuse or repurposing can be quite a challenge. Um, so back in 2017, I, we reached out to a local um, a local engineering company that uh, re uh, that uh, repurposes chopsticks, and um, well, if you just want to play the video, we can play the video, and then we can have a little chat about it after. Chop value is as simple as it gets. We take used chopsticks and turn them into new viable products. What we like about the relationship with YBR is they're actually looking for innovative solutions for every single piece that they can keep out of the waste streams. So when I walk into our factory and I see mountains and mountains of chopsticks, I'm obviously so happy because that's how much we captured that otherwise would have ended up on the landfill. We set a target to divert 50% of the waste that we produce in the terminal away from landfill. So we've been at 51% diversion, and a significant part of that is through innovative practices like what we're doing with our chopstick diversion. What you see behind us is a bit of a demonstration of some of the chopsticks that have been collected here on the Lower Mainland. And today we are celebrating the one millionth recycled chopstick here at the airport. We want to rethink how we use products, how we make more conscious decisions as consumer. And that's what we're doing right now with great partners like YBI. So um, that video was our one million chopstick. We, re we celebrated a collection of one million chopsticks at um, so as uh, as Michael had said, we have a large uh, Asian population here in Vancouver, and the airport has a, a number of um, of quick service restaurants and restaurants that use chopsticks. So we uh, developed a partnership with a local uh, company called Chop Value, and they pick up uh, the chopsticks that are collected in our terminals, and they then in turn turn it into uh, wood products. So they make flooring, furniture, um, coasters. Uh, other lighting projects, those sorts of things. And, and in fact, we took some of these chopsticks that have been collected over the years and, re and made some furniture that is now on display within our terminal. So we made some coffee tables and tables, uh, food court tables to sit at. Additionally, uh, we have this ongoing competition with our tenants on how to reduce and recycle their waste in their facilities. And at the end of the, the competition, we always award the winner, the best recycler, uh, the base waste diver with a uh, chopstick trophy that's shaped like a garbage can. And it's uh, made from about 3000 chopsticks, I believe. So it's a pretty unique way of uh, working with local operators, as well as reusing and uh, repurposing products that normally would either go to the landfill or to the compost uh, facility. What an interesting, an interesting initiative. <laughs> we both had the same idea, myself and Michael. Really, really interesting initiative there, Shay. I actually want to just uh, throw that question um, or throw a question out to uh, Tracy and, and Melanie at, um, at uh, Abu Dhabi to ask if there have been uh, sort of similar uh, incentives, uh, I guess, to um, showcase more uh, sustainable uh, initiatives or examples. Um, you as uh, obviously operators there. Uh, is, is there anything just to add to what Shay's uh, explained there in terms of um, you know increasing that partnership uh, interplay through encouraging um, incentives on recycling or, or elsewhere? Um, yes, I mean that's Shay. That's an absolutely fabulous initiative. I might have to steal something from that if you don't mind. <laughs> Um, the initiative we're working on at the moment is the collection of the plastic bottles, um, as I mentioned earlier. So we've um, currently in discussions, or ADAC um, sustainability team and ourselves are currently in discussions with a local supplier um, 
for the collection of plastic bottles through reverse vending machines, which we're looking to have dotted around the terminal and encourage customers to return their bottles to these machines, which are linked to a, a return and reward app on your mobile. So those rewards can then be redeemed either in store or on the downtown or your points then accumulated and then converted into some local CSR initiative planting of trees. So this is something that we're working together in partnership, um, ADAC, Lagadere, ourselves, possibly the F&B guys, um, to firstly get that message out to our customers um, on getting these bottles off, off the, you know, the, local, the local market and then the delivering of the message as to what is then done with the bottles, as I was saying earlier on, by converting it into the bags, the t-shirts, which we're looking to um, either have our staff, you know, the staff wearing, the airport team wearing, and delivering the message to the customer of what's being done with their plastic bottles, and potentially also looking at linking with downtown companies um, and extending the initiative to the downtown. So once the airport is up and, up, and, up and operational, it's all about how do we continue the story from the airport to the downtown market. So it is um, still work in progress at the moment, to be honest with you, um, but some interesting initiatives going on behind the scenes. Thanks so much for that, uh, Tracy. Melanie, would you like to, to add anything to that? Continuing that conversation, uh, indeed, away from the airport to downtown as well, something that you, you may be looking at? Oh, yes, I think the, the examples given by uh, Tracy uh, I, are the good ones. And uh, yes, we are, we are working on, uh, on, the same, uh, on the same project. And I think the, the example given also uh, about uh, the T-shirts our teams are wearing uh, that are made uh, out of uh, recycled plastic and uh, are also good ones, good messages uh, for customers. Uh, in terms of partnerships, uh, we are also working uh, hard also to, uh, uh, to, um, to find ways and together with uh, some of our uh, suppliers such as, um, such as uh, Danone Waters or Coca-Cola to, um, to find also uh, uh, fun and uh, interesting also uh, promotion programs, uh, activations. Uh, on site also to uh, to educate customers to uh, to have them also being uh, sensibilized to the to recycling uh, so to have also all this uh, recycling thing uh, being also managed in airports or be, be it in our stores of course but also uh, all around also the the recycling uh, process or flow uh, within the airport and we know that uh, it's not it's not uh, fully done also in all the airports. So we, uh, we also need all of us and so together with, uh, together with brands, but also with airports to deal with that. So of course, communicating with customers, but once they will have done their job, we will have also to do ours, you know, really managing this uh, recycling uh, flow to make sure that at the end, yes, all these uh, plastic bottles are recycled the, the right way. So it's uh, something very, uh, also very important and also, yes, we are trying uh, to, uh, well, we are working in partnerships also with some, uh, with some brands to, to work on that. Sorry, if I can also add, so um, in addition to the resellable merchandise, there are construct, there are companies out there who are um, recycling using the plastic, the plastic bottles that are collected locally um, and then used in the construction of, um, of buildings, for example, a very famous company used recycled material in the building of the Louvre. And so that would be a fabulous story that could be told is if the bottles that were collected in the airport are then converted into building materials and utilized on the downtown market. And that would be the greater initiative um, that we would aspire to, to, to look at an initiative like that. Um, it's, it's a lot of work to be put into the collaboration of the, of the two partners, but I do believe it is possible. A superb aspiration, uh, it really is. Um, I'm going to jump back, if I may, at this point. Question for Hugo. I'm keen to address some of the, some of the questions coming in. Um, we talked, obviously, a lot earlier about um, in-store furniture and fixtures and, and, and some of those modular concepts as well. Question for Hugo directly. First of all, 
uh, love how you're addressing POSM, it's such a big area of hidden waste. Uh, but aside from permanent fixtures, how are you addressing waste associated with temporary uh, POSM for pop ops and promos? You may have already alluded to that somewhat, uh, Hugo, in your earlier response regarding eco scoring, but perhaps you could tackle that question. So, on temporary POSM, I think the it's also to I, when I was looking at one of the POSM Caroline 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 was sharing. Sorry, for example, I didn't see any electrical ele, electrical elements or electronic components on the examples Caroline was sharing. And I think this is one of the first things we need to think about when we think temporary is why do we need to go full on for temporary? Yes, they have to look good, they have to shine, they have to stand out in the airport, but you don't need to put electricity on those temporary. You have plenty of lights in the ceiling, so maybe that's one thing is to to think, okay, it's temporary, let's limit ourselves at some point. And, and the second one is definitely the use of materials because when you go temporary, usually you, can, you might think, oh, I'm gonna use a, a, a cheap material, it's only for a few weeks, and then we'll throw it away. But uh, uh, I think definitely you can use materials which can be repurposed. So the carcass, because in our industry, the carcass is usually made of MDF, which is really not a sustainable material. And if you wanna go sustainable, it costs a lot. If you go with carcass which are made of light aluminum profiles, you can very much reuse those carcass for future activations and you can redress them to look completely differently. So it's a, it's a different way of looking at the design and it's eco-design. It's using materials not for one-shot temporary product launch, but to use a carcass that can be reused for the future product launch and easily stocked in a very small format because they are dismantable. So there are solutions, but the thing is, as you know, the industry today, when it comes to a brand design, is usually based on toolkits. So the brands are doing their design toolkits. And those design toolkits are then being used all around the world to produce brand fixtures. If the toolkit says the design fixture should be built that way, then it is built that way all around the world. So when we design the toolkits, if we think about sustainability and recyclability and reuse, reusage of these fixtures, if you put it in the toolkit, it will have a global impact. And I think that the goal is that uh, to put those initiatives in the toolkit, that they, so they are imposed all around the world. It doesn't prevent local initiative to improve the toolkit from a sustainable point of view due to the local uh, specifications. But this will be, I think, a big step forward. A question that came up yesterday, which is interesting, and this, this session is all about partnerships, but this question is, question is um, going to see how far we can push the envelope on, on, on partnerships, uh, literally. Um, the question was um, pertaining to commercial terms, um, and it was more aimed at retailers. Um, if we want to get more sustainable brands, eco-friendly brands, brands, products coming from social enterprises, charities, B Corps, and so on, they may not have the, the same... Uh, leverage uh, to accept the kind of margins you're seeing in, in airport retail today. Would retailers be willing to uh, consider more advantageous commercial terms for such brands like B Corp, social enterprises, charity brands, and so on? Um, the answer that was given um, was uh, diplomatically, it's probably not the right place to, to discuss commercial terms here, but um, the, 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 you know, because obviously airports have to get involved as well. And so the reaction to that was, well, maybe airports would be who are wanting to push a more sustainably focused agenda would be more interested in also looking at renegotiating terms for, for retailers who are accepting more B Corps and sustainable brands and so on. So that question I'd like to put to Tracy, Melanie and Shay, is this something that you collectively um, as, as partners would be willing to consider. So more favorable commercial conditions for more sustainable products in stores. I'll start with um, Melanie on that one. Yes, for pleasure. Uh, yes, I, I think it's a very good, uh, very good question. Of course, uh, yes, we want to uh, we want to have more and more of this kind of brand 
in our assortment. Uh, sorry for the noise, uh, but um, and yes, at some point it may uh, it may raise the question of margin, but maybe not. Uh, we we need to check. I'm I'm not hundred percent sure of uh, this uh, of this impact because uh, the international brands we are working with um, uh, may may not be the cheapest one either. So uh, you know we we don't know. <laughs> maybe we will have a, a good surprise, but. Uh, uh, yes, I think it's a it's a question also of uh, of willingness and together, and uh, it's a good question also for for Shay. But yes, if uh, if it's uh, also some a common a common decision, uh, yes, when it comes to commercial terms, uh, we could have also have a, a support from uh, <laughs> from airports uh, on that part, uh, decreasing a little bit the, the rent. So it could be also a common uh, <laughs> common effort <laughs> when we talk about partnership. But um, yes, no, we need to check. And I think that at the end, what is important also for customers is, is to have a is to have a balanced mix. And uh, so uh, coming back to uh, coming back to to Richard and Mondelez, uh, of course, uh, Toblerone, Toblerone is a must also in our assortment. Uh, but of course, it will be uh, it will be also uh, we will have beside uh, some uh, some more uh, craft and local. Uh, for example, we were talking about the, the, the store we are working on in Geneva Airport that will be a full green store. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, of course, it's uh, also a question of partnership partnership with Geneva Airport, but we are talking, uh, talking with uh, Richard to uh, maybe to build a nice story because, of course, Geneva, Switzerland, Toblerone uh, has a, <laughs> a very good, uh, will have a very good place in it. And so having a nice story and, of course, uh, we will have different, uh, different kind of brands. But uh, yes, and Toblerone can be local also in some places. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's also a good, uh, a good, uh, a good thing. Indeed. <laughs> Let's put Shay on the spot on that one then. That's a tough question. And uh, as a senior environmental specialist, it's a lit out of my area of expertise, the whole retail and commercial commercial side of it. But if you were to ask the environmental person in me, of course, you know, we would like to see more local or uh, more social um, enterprise uh, products being sold. But I think it does come down to, you know, uh, we're a business like anything else and it comes down to, uh, you know, to, to obviously demand. You know, is there the demand for... A product, and then also, I, I think Melanie said it as well as you know, there's margin as well. Uh, but it's a good question, and I think as an airport, I know here at YVR we do, uh, we do love local, uh, local products, and try to, and we do like to do lo things locally, as you as you saw through some of our one of our green partnerships that we have, and uh, so yeah, I think we're always looking for for new opportunities to innovate how we uh, do business within uh, in the retail space. So as the, as the chief sustainability person, it's uh, your role to advocate for that. Really. Absolutely. I mean, that's really what we what our department does is we drive these initiatives and, uh, you know, and uh, push our other departments to uh, uh, work. It, getting we get buy in, we come up with the ideas and then everyone else has they have to execute it. We help them execute. What do they need to do? So it's a very good. That's a good, uh, uh, good point there, Michael. Tracy, would you like to say that one? Well, I think as it's a, a, a commercial question, uh, Michael, it's a bit out of my league, so I'm going to diplomatically refrain, but I would say it's possible. <laughs> and in the planning phase, we would normally um, allocate about three to five percent of our overall footprint to local product. Um, and that is so important to have local product on the market to um, add to the sense of place element that Hugo referred to earlier on. So there is always where the opportunity is space dedicated. To, to local product and the terms um, I believe are slightly different. Um, so yeah, but I think Melanie, both Melanie and Shay answered that question quite well. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. Um, Luke, I think we're, we're, we've gone pretty well over time. We so, are running uh, out of time, yeah. Before I um, do my closing remarks, I'll let you uh, do your wrap up. But I think what is interesting to say is um, to comment on what we've heard so far in this session and in other sessions is that you know the the topic of partnerships and, and with different terms has been used for the well, last 20 years or so but it seems as though you know it's it's all 
company has been paying lip service to the topic very much so in recent years, but it's actually sustainability that seems to be really getting people around the table and partnering, whether it's not just between airports, retailers, cruise companies, brands and so on, but also across com competitors as well. So that's fantastic to see and very encouraging. And we look forward to talking more about uh, sustainable partnerships in the future. So Luke, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, very much to, to echo that. I think it's been an absolutely fascinating conversation, some really rich dialogue. And I truly believe that we're really advocating a new language and vocabulary around sustainable partnership. I'm very happy to be part of this conversation. I think uh, this is a watershed moment. I think, you know, one of the, the main objectives of this whole programme, Sustainability Week, is to inject new ideas, knowledge sharing, and bring partners closer together. And I think we are achieving that um, and it's important that we continue in, in this spirit and in this manner. Without uh, further ado, I'd just like to thank all our panellists uh, for their insights today. Um, you know, really, really informed and in some incisive commentary. I'd also like to just reiterate my thanks to our partners, our session partners, Arianta International, of course, uh, Beam Centauri, Crown Foreman, Coty and Mondelez and all our premium partners for continuing to support this event. If there is uh, any example of the value that we're creating, I think it's through this session and I'm sure you will all attest to that. Stay with us. Tomorrow we have a, a, another really exciting session, a series of sessions. We have our uh, sustainability pitch, uh, next sustainability pitch round um, and we have two more very uh, exciting sessions on the agenda so we'd urge you all to uh, tune in for those of course as Michael mentioned at the start of this webinar we have a closing keynote um, that we're happy to announce uh, on the Friday so we hope that will wrap up a really really successful and productive week and we're looking forward to hearing from from Anson Bailey and KPMG um, in that regard. So look, all that remains from me to say is thank you once again to all our panellists. Thank you, Michael. Um, and of course, thank you to all of you watching and viewing and engaging. Look forward to keeping this dialogue going and rejoining many of you tomorrow. Michael, back to you. Thank you. You said it all. I was just scooting over the slides there um, to showcase some tomorrow's sessions as you were talking through that. Um, I'd just like to also um, thank all of you for watching and um, of course Shay, Tracy, Melanie, Abby, Caroline, Richard and Hugo for your fantastic contributions. It's been really, really rich. Please note that the session recording is going to be online soon after this session ends if you want to watch it again or if any colleagues have missed it. Um, uh, do also please share any comments about this session or the events on social media using the hashtag Travel Retail Sustainability Week and of course, um, copying hashtag TR business so we can share your comments and spread the good news about all the sustainability going on in, in the industry. Um, Luke's gone over uh, the tomorrow's session, so I won't repeat that, um, but do come back and join us for those. And of course, for uh, the live stream of earthday.org's live event, as we mentioned at the beginning, and the closing keynote, as, as Luke alluded to also. Have a wonderful rest of day or evening, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Take care.